begin with prayer tonight if we're at 702, okay? Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we open your word together, we're committed to making every effort to lay aside our own biases, the influence of the culture around us, even habits of thinking that we've adopted over the years, in an effort to hear your word better, to learn from it, and as Paul would have us, to begin conforming our minds to it so that we might not be conformed to the present age, that we might start thinking the Lord's thoughts after him and see the scripture as normative 2,000 years later for the life and mission and faith of the church. So be with us tonight as we look into your word, as we have conversation about it together, and may we be edified together as your people. Amen. Oh, hi, Chris. Not Chris. Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Did you get one? I used to call Michelle Steelman Rachel all the time and vice versa, so. They call me Chris all the time. Yeah. Well, when I was in seminary in the apartment, everyone else in the apartment knew me as Harrison's dad because he was this cute little kind of effervescent personality and, oh, you're Harrison's dad. Yeah, that's me. Now I'm Marsha's husband, so. <laughs> All right, I thought tonight there is a developing method to the way we're reading the pastoral epistles. It's in process, but I think it's taking clearer shape. My ambition is not necessarily to get through all 13 chapters. If we do that, that's fine, but that's not my primary goal. That would be a lot of material to, co to cover. Rather, I would like to have these sort of loose categories that we find within the pastoral epistles and find key passages that represent those and develop the categories slash passages together. And so, I thought chronologically it might be helpful to start with the arena or the context in which the church and its mission are accomplished, where, where they are taking place, where it's active. And because my typical foil is the larger evangelical culture. Um, I returned to my ninth harmful tendency in evangelicalism as sort of a kickoff spot. Evangelicalism is constantly reacting to the world, continually redefining itself and its mission in response to a perceived need or crisis. And so if you were to study it, and you were to land within any decade of Christianity in, say, the last 120 years or so, you would find characteristics of that decade that were informed deeply by whatever the culture was undergoing in that decade. Um, when, in fact, I would say, from Paul's perspective, the church exists within a permanent state of crisis, which the Old Testament identified as the tribulation. So once again, we're in the realm of eschatology, right? Because what does tribulation mean to the ordinary Christian that you might meet at your Christian school or at the church you go to, or at Bible study fellowship, or whatever. 
the, seven years. Well, hell, hey, that means you're you're a uh, what is that pre pre trib? Yeah. yeah. So. I did a speech in eighth grade. I was fascinated by this. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, that is that is fascinating. It's just not biblical, yeah. right? And that's what makes it so fascinating because it's so much fun. But of course, the tribulation in American Christianity is the seven year period of trouble on earth, of intense trouble that precedes the advent of the Lord. And then we break it down, as far as I recall, into pre, mid, and post trib as the place to. Um, place the rapture in the in the scheme of things but in biblical eschatology the tribulation overlaps with what we call the last days so we're in the tribulation now and if this were Martin Luther with a group of Lutherans he could have said to them just as seriously we are in the tribulation now. <laughs> in English, with a German Yeah, that's how we always do it in the movies. <laughs> and then we drop a German word in once in a while, like Dumkopf. Right. So, it's just, it's just, I mean, are you talking about the tribulation? Yes. Capital T's? Yeah, but I'm not going to capitalize the T. Okay. It's just tribulation. Okay? That's part of the already not yet that's up on the board. So, um, Augustine lived during the tribulation and ministered, and we are as well. This is reason 100 why getting your eschatology right is so vital to understanding the New Testament. Because of you, Debbie, the tribulation is related to the rapture, which is related almost exclusively to Christians who live within this country. No, I, as far as I know, and I may be mistaken, but I do listen a little bit to Christians elsewhere, Christians in most parts of the world don't care about these things, right? We're the only ones that I know of who have prophecy experts. And by that, they are the people who read the newspaper and try and line up the latest development, the latest development being China's involvement in the Middle East, which is setting the stage for, there's always, the stage is always being set for something, okay? So, leaving that aside, I don't think Paul would ever redefine the church or reformulate its mission because he read the newspaper or got his finger wet and stuck it up in the air to find out what, which way the wind was blowing. Okay. This is what I meant when I was introducing the Strangers and Aliens Sunday School bit where we talked about how normative is the New Testament Right? How directly does it speak to us? And I think Paul would say that what he has to say to Timothy in these passages is permanent. So that whoever picks up the pastoral epistles and reads especially chapter 3 verses 1 through 9 where he can't come up with um, enough nouns and adjectives to describe humanity and its fallenness, that this is just the way things are in the world. Whether you're in Africa or China or India, whether you live in the 12th century or the 21st century, this is the world as it is and as it's always been. And so the church's radar has to be finely tuned and directed not necessarily to what's taking place in the culture at large, but what's actually taking place within the boundaries of the professing Christian church. That's where our interest is, right? So we've flipped that in 
again, generally speaking, in American Christianity, uh, it's as if we put all the Border Patrol agents on the Canadian border and left 10% facing the southern border, and we hope no one gets in. Well, even if we don't have it that way, people are coming into the country uh, in droves, but if we aren't looking in the right direction, we're not seeing the people who are actually coming into the church who have the appearance of Christianity and yet are actually the kinds of people that Paul is describing right here. All right. So if you go swimming, does it make a difference to you whether the, whether the stream you're swimming in uh, is uh, fierce rapids or a gentle brook? Will you prepare accordingly? Okay. Uh, if you're climbing Mount Everest, will you climb it like you would climb, say, Mount Monadnock in New Hampshire? Or will you consult with experts, be properly trained? And s the analogies go on and on and on, right? Oh, we have a guest tonight. Welcome. Would it be all right if we asked you to introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Michael, everyone. Um, I'm 18 years old at Rutgers High School, I'm a senior. Um, and yeah, I know uh, Dr. Brooks over here. Yeah. Hi, Michael. Well, welcome tonight. Yes. Have a seat. I am Jeff Smith, and I'm the pastor here. Maybe we just go around quick. You won't remember anybody's name, but we do this as a formality. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, sorry, with me? Yeah. Okay, all right. I'm Harrison. I'm Karen. Yeah. I'm Ron. Lisa. Jean. Debbie. I'm Emily. And do we have an egg? Oh, you got a handout. Okay. I was, I, I won't necessarily repeat everything I just said, but my basic point is that as Paul communicates with Timothy, who he's appointed to administer and organize and get into shape the church slash churches in Ephesus. We're sort of beginning this part of the study by getting the lay of the land. Is the situation in Ephesus safe or is it hostile? Is it accommodating to Christianity, or is it resistant? And if it's hostile and resistant, and Paul would say that it is both, then how should the church think about its community life, its worship, and its mission within the boundaries of this hostility and resistance? this antagonism. The church, is, the church is not being welcomed. Okay, But my main point, Mike, in saying that from the epistles is that the circumstances that Paul describes here are permanent circumstances. Christianity, wherever it is, whenever it is. Now, it might be more severe or less severe, right? It may be tolerated more in one place for this or that reason, less tolerated in another place. It might be openly persecuted by a government in certain areas, but Paul's concern is not with formal governmental persecution. Paul's concern is with the kinds of people who make their way into the church and how destructive the wrong people can be to the Christian community. Okay, So that's sort of where we're starting. And therefore the church, as Paul is instructing his faithful disciple, is actually a dangerous place. Which of course 
is part of the already not yet because it's also the place where love is to grow right and we're to be united right so these two things are always in stress all right so the new testament's view of human nature is true and reliable where our own view and it's our view that influences the ninth harmful tendency is biased and imperfect another way to put that is we tend to judge people superficially where paul is as you can tell by this section much more interested in what makes a person tick yes okay any any questions about this this is the backdrop for the need for sound mature and responsible elders i think we'll might do that part next because the inherent weakness among the christians means that not only are they in a hostile territory but they are also um, especially attracted to things that are inherently dangerous gee i think there's an analogy for that uh, what is it about wolves and sheep or something who said that i think it was jesus and then paul right and we sort of think well that's not johnson county that's places where the church has it tough but i would say if we're reading paul correctly then it is johnson county and it is the places where the wolves are less likely to disguise themselves and maybe more open and aggressive in their tactics so all of this will flow together he said hopefully all right who'd like to read first timothy 4 1 through 5. you can either read it from your text or the slightly amended version that you have in front of you on the sheet all right now the spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that god created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. All right. So tell me what's going on here before I just dive in. I think so. In fact, it might be useful just to grab a little of the context because I did put the suggestion that however might be transitional here. So if you go to the end of 1 Timothy 3, Verse 14, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of God godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. However, if that's how it's translated, at the same time, the Spirit has expressly said that 
some will depart from the faith. Okay, so there may be something of a contrast there. If not, we haven't lost much. So, the Spirit expressly says, where? You mean in this room? No. Oh. On my phone. Oh, on your phone. Okay. That the Spirit expressly says. By him who's writing it. Okay, so the Spirit expressly says to Paul. Maybe. Maybe. That's right. Maybe. It could be. Uh, other writers in the New Testament will associate the Spirit with the written Word of God, so that the Spirit says, and then they quote a passage from the Old Testament. It could be that this was uttered as a prophecy by a prophet, and Paul is passing it on. So, carry your guesses as good as any. We don't need a prophet to tell us this, because as we see in the next section, that in the last days there will come some difficulty. And that last days reference, as I think just about all of them in the New Testament are, as to the, the present evil age. So that's just a little side discussion. The main part is that in the later times, some will depart from the faith. So they were within the Christian community, but they've left. So that's, that's a part of living in the tribulation, that there will be people in the community who will leave it, and as they leave it, or they leave it because they are devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, that's pretty wolfish, isn't it? Teachings of demons? Boy, that's got to be a, just about the worst possible thing that you could imagine, right? I mean, it must be like having mass orgies under the influence of drugs, right? Or it's false teachers who forbid marriage and require abstinence from food that God created to be received with thanksgiving. Does that sound like a teaching from demons? Deceitful spirits? It seems very different. It doesn't seem serious necessarily. Oh, thank you, Kara. Kara's honest. It doesn't seem all that serious, does it? But apparently, and we know this from the Bible, and really any type of interaction with world religions, that there are two areas of life that religion, broadly speaking, tends to interfere with. That is, somehow in the realm of human sexuality and in diet. Right? Israel has a dietary code. It's given to them by God. Right? So, these are two areas where it's likely religion of one sort or another, a teaching of one sort or another, will focus. In this case, it seems to be that, well, it's an ultra-ascetic life that they're being called to. We all know what ascetic means? <laughs> ascetic. You're, it's strict is a great word to introduce it. Restrictions, it's like being real. The denial of worldly pleasure. Yeah, I think it's the denial of worldly pleasure by the conscientious adoption of um, practices where I am forbidden to
to participate in uh, maybe building wealth, eating certain foods, uh, in this case, marriage, right? Both, are, both extremes are kind of in religion. You could join one religion where I can have six wives and have as much as I want to eat and as much money as I want. And then the other version of a religion might say uh, no marriage or they might strictly govern the sexual uh, relationship within the marriage and we can't eat these foods because it's against our religion. Okay. Well, Paul says this kind of thing is not harmless, just as he says in Colossians. It's not harmless, and that characteristic of the tribulation, of the time in which we live right now, believers will leave the Christian community by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, which, of course, isn't um, a direct experience, but mediated through liars, people who don't tell the truth, and whose consciences are seared. So this is what you're dealing with, Timothy. This is how you should think if you are, by my appointment, in Ephesus, trying to organize, establish, protect, and instruct the local church. You're in hostile territory. Paul's answer to the dietary issue is simple. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy. Right? That doesn't mean it's, it becomes morally valuable. It simply it means it's been sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Okay, so that's true doctrine. Let's talk about that. There's a lot of diets out there. <laughs> Diet, religious diets or? No, food diets. Food diets, well, no. maybe for good reasons, health reasons, weight loss reasons, who knows. But this is purely religious. This is about religious scruples, right? Again, Israel is the model for this, and God gave them a dietary code, a very elaborate one, in fact. But in the course of redemptive history, we know this from the book of Acts especially, that with the end of that covenant came the end of kosher kitchens. Now any food um, that's received lawfully with thanksgiving is acceptable. We aren't separating ourselves from anybody by our diets. Is it kind of akin to what, when we did the Galatians study and the, some of the Christians were requiring circumcision of those who, you know, of the Gentiles, is it kind of this, a lot of the same yeah. things? Yeah, exactly. Though, of course, to stress that point, circumcision meant entry into a Torah lifestyle, which would have included a dietary code. This is so obvious, people. That's why Paul has to deal with it so often. The way we treat our bodies is the way we gain spiritual maturity, right? Right? Wrong. Sorry, Mike. I'm, I do that when I teach. I actually teach at Whitfield. Do you guys ever interact with Whitfield Academy? Uh, don't take it further than that, no. See, no one ever hears of us. <laughs> See, George, you're right. We need to change the name. We've been there for 30 years, practically. We're over on Holmes Road. Oh, oh you're pretty close to Rockers, now. Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> Every once in a while, one of our students goes over to Rockhurst mm -hmm. because they, the sports or something like that. But yeah, we're the... It's kind of... Nobody cares about us. <laughs> but I, I teach, I've taught high school there, and right now I'm teaching a couple of middle school classes. So when I have young people, I like to give them a hard time. Yeah. <laughs> so this might be your last night with us. I hope... It, I hope. 
It's okay. He gives old people a heart. Yeah, I, get, I like that. But by stressing it that way, I'm appealing to what people typically know universally, that the way we treat our bodies, for instance, dietary codes or even other forms of self-denial or in the extreme, self-harm, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the road to spiritual maturity. And Paul would say, no, that's not the road to spiritual maturity. In fact, though it looks like it's a wise way to proceed, it, there's no value in it whatsoever. Not like, okay, yeah, you know, fool around with it and find out what works. No, there's no value in it whatsoever. Because Christianity is something else entirely, especially because of the Spirit's presence in the church. And so, Timothy, here's what you need to expect. And these are examples of false teaching, right? Doesn't mean that these will be reproduced identically to what Timothy dealt with in Ephesus in the first century. They'll manifest themselves in a hundred, if not a thousand different ways. But this is where the church is doing its work under the, the harsh realities of teachings of demons operating through people who do not tell the truth and whose consciences are seared. What does that mean? I was just going to say, just kind of dulled down. You don't feel anything towards any action. That would be my best guess, too that they have no conscience because it's been seared. There's been a suggestion that they are actually branded consciences and they have Satan's brand on them. But either way, these aren't people who have much sympathy for their students. They're more interested in getting them to behave in a way that gives them control and thus power over them than actually helping them grow as Christian people. And as a result, people who were once professing Christians are no longer in the church. Timothy, this is the reality that you're dealing with. Okay. Anything else about that? There are lots of bad people out there. Sometimes it's not even bad people as much as, you know, just that whole kind of need to have these legalistic boundaries because it's easier. Um, so, you know, certain, certain places just think, you know, we have to make these rules to, you know, show boundaries. Right. Which ends up becoming a real problem because people go into the mentality of, I have to do this to be saved. Wrong. Right. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think the well-intentioned dimension to that will inevitably backfire because Paul says we don't do that, period. And that's an important distinction because I could see a well-intentioned effort by the leader of a Christian community to set up artificial boundaries but we're not talking about people who are, you know, um, so strong in their Christian faith to begin with that they can probably tolerate a little bit of order that's artificial, right? This is where Ephesians 4 comes in especially. Inevitably, it will end up being more about the boundaries than it will be about authentic spirituality. But what's interesting about the next section, and so who'd like to read this? Okay. Three, one through nine. Right. Okay. 
But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. Okay. <clears throat> this is a description of people who live outside of Johnson County. So if you if you cross over into Missouri, for instance, sorry, Kara, this is what you'll find. But in inside Johnson County, these people don't exist. They're they're not welcome. So we're safe. But for the people on Zoom who may leave Johnson County, this is what you're going to encounter. Okay. Why is disobedient to their parents in there? Because presumably, I, I think of all these things applying to adults. I mean, I don't do everything my parents want me to do. Oh, yeah. You're reading it a little too subjectively, I think. Okay. The, the, the sense is probably that they don't honor their parents in a way that would be consistent with their familial obligations. Which is interesting because what's the very next word? Ungrateful. Or ungrateful. Maybe even ungrateful to the people who cared for them and raised them and provided for them. Right? Let me read my version. Because there's a little joke in it. But understand this, that in the last days, and when are the last days? Right? Wow. Yes, from, from about the period of the resurrection or the day of Pentecost until the parousia, till the appearance of Jesus at the end of the age, right? There will come times of difficulty. Hard times are, are here, Timothy. Um, so we might pause for, for the sake of syntax and say, why, Paul? Explain to us why there will be times of difficulty in the last days. And my little joke is people, because of people. And I thought, we'll read that, then I'll say, we'll, we'll pray and go home. Because of people. People are a huge problem. Everywhere for everybody, people are a problem. In the, at the micro level, families are under stress because of the people who are in them. On the much grander level, one nation may desire the elimination of an entire people group because people are a problem. They get in the way of the ambition of this other nation, right? So if you were to if you were to scan the globe, this is really a universal reality. You will find just about every place that there is a tension between people groups. Not in the United States, of course, but if you're outside the country, it's all about sharing space with people. So that's not exactly what Paul is saying, but I'm saying that. But, um, yeah, go ahead. So what you were saying about Johnson County would 
does that mean? Like, that was a joke, right? My poor wife. <laughs> We've been married 41 years, and she still can't. Okay, I thought so. <laughs> I, I was waiting for you to comment on it. I need, I, a sarca I need a sarcasm emoji. Yeah, you need to be more tongue-in-cheek when you talk like that. Yeah, no, I'm as, I'm as dry as dust. <laughs> yes, that was hyper-sarcasm. And it, it's a way to stress the point that despite everything that Paul says, and the Bible in general, we are operating under the conviction that because we're physically and materially safe, and that people are generally friendly and share many virtues with the Christian faith, that we're really all kind of getting along quite well. But the point from the last passage was that there are deceitful spirits and demonic teachings going on and they don't recognize the boundaries of counties in Kansas or any other boundary anywhere in the world for that matter. So this is our problem that our own view is biased and imperfect. So in effect we're suspending our own natural judgment in favor of the explicit teaching of Scripture so that we know where we are as the people of God living in a community of faith and worship. Okay? So then let's take it to the other extreme then. Should, should we in the church start suspecting each other? Yes. Okay. Well, I already know you suspect me. Either. Yes. <laughs> no. And I've addressed that on a number of occasions. And my standard answer is, already and not yet. The two coexist in, a, in, an, in an almost agonizing way, right? Because I could spend four weeks on John 15 and stress the great, or the new commandment rather, that we are to love one another as Jesus loved us, that there's no greater love than this, than a person lay down his life for his friend. All over the, the epistles, the stress on love and unity. Okay, so that's one side. And all of that is supposed to take place in the context of cultures where none of that is appreciated or valued. In fact, the fundamental characteristic of the world is, according to John, hatred, darkness, and death. How do these things coexist? Well, this is what makes Christianity the light of the world. If it can exist in this type of world, then that is, in fact, light. That is temple. That is supernatural. So to fall back on the various boundary rules and regulations is to become like everybody else. Our guys do this. We dress like this. We eat this way. We avoid that. We don't go here. This is our day and all the rest. Paul says, no, that's just more of the same thing. Real light is existing as God's people in this context. And it's enormous. Well, what does he say? In the last times, there will come times of difficulty. So this is where you're working, Timothy. He's not talking about East St. Louis. He's talking about everywhere. All right? So let's go through this. People in the last days. Is this hard to believe, by the way? They'll be lovers of self, lovers of money, and when you see that little ah prefix, um, an elder qualification in 3.3 is not a lover of money. The word, the, another form of the word lovers of money shows up in the famous passage in 1 Timothy 6.10. The root of the evils is philagoria. I, 
that's my crude translation. We say the root of all evils or something. It's a plural, but it's the love of money. So, I've made this point before, and I'll try it again. In, this, in the tension between progressive Christianity and traditional or more conservative Christianity, the, more, the virtues and morals tend to break along political lines, right? So the more progressive Christianity, they express themselves in language that would be more familiar among people who are progressively political. Social justice, feed the poor, right? How's the, the homeless, right? Does that, am, am I not making sense? Because no one even nods. I need some nodding. I need to see where you're going. Yeah. No, I'm not going anywhere. I'm making a point. On the conservative side, they tend to go for the law and order issues, which are also, in some way or another, connected to the Bible. Crime is bad. We should have uh, a sound justice system. We need to get rid of the evils of abortion, pornography, and so forth. And does this make sense? I'm not judging either side. I'm just talking about the language, right? Um, <laughs> now I forgot why I said all of that. That's your fault, Kara, because you interrupted me. Hmm. Oh, well, one point I would make is, yes, here's where I was going. I would say Christians on the conservative side of things are very tolerant of money loving. They wouldn't put it that way, right? But they are very much in favor of the conditions where wealth can be created and the larger their organizations grow, the more dependent they are on people who make lots of money. Money is important to evangelical and conservative people. Is that a fair statement? I'm not even criticizing money, right? Okay, now, the way I'm talking this way, what I'm saying is, the break politically does not reflect the biblical reality, which is all of these things are held together within the church. And so we're hard on some people. If you're not behaving sexually, we're going to come down on you with 16 tons. But we're soft on other people, where Paul would be hard on both people. That's what I'm trying to say. And of course, Paul's purview is the life within the church. And so, this is why we, whenever we adopt moral stances publicly, we inevitably misrepresent the entire teaching of Scripture. If you like the prophets, for instance, you're going to find them angry with people who are on the conservative side of the spectrum and on the progressive side of the spectrum. They're going to be angry with both sides, even though each of those two sides think they're on the side of the angels. Okay? That's part of our bias and imperfect way of interpreting our situation. The rules are different within the body of Christ. And so, 19 points are listed here. Lovers of self, lovers of money, people are proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, that is, they treat things that are holy with a disregard, heartless. They don't have any love in them. Well, they do have love. They love their self. They love themselves. They love money. They love pleasure. Uh, the things that they don't love are the things that get them into trouble. They don't love God, and they don't love good. They engage in slander. Unappeasable means they're unwilling to reconcile. They don't forgive anybody. They hold grudges. Like we could just pass these around the room. Um, Emily 
give me something that's related to pride. Let's go right through the list. Debbie, you can do arrogant. Gene, you can be abusive. Mike, you get, oh, that, that's not fair. You're only 18 years old. Oh, that disobedient to parents. Yeah, what, yeah, yeah. I did not plan this ahead of time, believe me. Uh, ungrateful, Doug, Lisa, you could do unholy is a little bit vague. Let's go to heartless. Unappeasable for Ron. Slanderous. Karen knows about slander. Maybe she talks about me. Uh, without self-control, I'll do brutal and not loving good, right? We pass over these things quickly when we do devotional reading, but Paul isn't just playing Scrabble here and throwing tiles out on the table to make words. He's thinking very carefully about how he's arranging all of these descriptives as a way to characterize the pool in which the Christian church is swimming. Because people are going to leak in from the outside and have the appearance of godliness, and especially there are going to be false teachers who come from this same pool. What do you want me to say? Something about proud. I want to give these words some feet. I'm, not, I'm still not clear on what... Okay, that in the last days, right, people, it's actually men, but the word man can mean people in general. In the last days, people will be lovers of self, lovers of money. Those are really two pillars, I think, of a fallen nature. They will be proud. So you want to know how they will be proud? Anything you, let's do, it's like a Rorschach test. <laughs> Association with the word proud. You feel like you just admit they're wrong. Ever. Okay, fine. It's people who are stubborn in their own opinion. Yes. And will never admit they're wrong. Even if a jury of their peers convened and unanimously agreed, you are in the wrong. Mike. I was going to add on to that great point right there by also saying someone who is very prideful, someone who is very proud, is someone who thinks in their heart that, you know, <clears throat> maybe A, I don't need God, or maybe B, I don't need help from someone else, or C, I can do it on my own. And I think the first step to um, defeating that is realizing that, you know, you've never been able to do anything on your own. And I think that. That's something we need to realize is that pride, at least to me, like over about a year I've realized it kind of like is like an invisible sin. Like you don't always notice it. Um, I think you can really sneak in um, and kind of just take over. Um, and it's a good thing to be aware about. But, uh, but yeah, definitely, um, it's definitely a hard one to come back. Um, so yeah. Yeah. And it's out there. Right? I'm not sure that the, these words describe every single human being in detail, but I think if you were to gather a random collection of a hundred people, all of these things would be represented in that collection. So pride is at the top of the list, self-sufficiency. Pride can even uh, disguise itself under virtues. Right? Self-sufficiency taken to the extreme, I think use the word, I don't need anybody's help, even when you or maybe the people you depend on, in fact, do need some help. And it's available in some way. Okay, Debbie, arrogant. Arrogant. Know-it-alls. Know-it-alls. They like to talk about everything because they know it all. <laughs> and they don't listen. Oh, my goodness. No humility. Not that you can think of anybody, right? <laughs> Gene, how about abusive? Well, I was thinking uh, somebody that wants their own way, always demands to get their own way, and 
really care about anybody else. You know, there's, there's kind of a thread here, right, as we're talking, because all of these things sound like people who love themselves. Okay, Mike, you got disobedient to their parents. Um, I mean, this one, yeah, probably definitely, I can definitely relate to this one. Um, I know I used to struggle with this a ton back when I was in my seventh and eighth grade. Um, and even my freshman and sophomore years of high school, I just remember a few nights where it was just really kind of rough. But, um, no, yeah, I definitely, um, that's another one that I guess I can still struggle with, especially now, um, even as um, a young man. But um, to be disobedient to your parents is kind of in violation of God's own authority. Um, it's simply in the sense that, I mean, your parents, um, at least I, look, I like to look at mine as kind of an authority administered by God. Um, and it's good to be um, obedient. Now I think God knows that the best of how important obedience really is. Um, and to do an act or portray any form of disobedience is, um, you know, I feel like doing that to your parents can be sometimes equivalent to doing that to God. Mm. So it's, That's very insightful. So that's how I feel. But, yeah, God created marriage and family before the fall. And though it's limping along a little bit since the fall, it's never lost its fundamental character and integrity. So I think you're right. Um, ungrateful. Yeah, so you, you have a certain level of expectation that you deserve it. You're not thankful for things because you think you should have it anyway. Okay. Lisa, you did do one, but we'll give you another shot. Well, I saw Heartless as somebody who would be like a murderer, somebody who has lax compassion when someone's struggling or something like that. You know, the, the example of murderer sort of brings it out to its logical conclusion, which is helpful for an illustration. But I imagine that along the, the line, there are levels of heartlessness that can manifest that way, but are present in other ways as well, which is true of all of these things. In fact, if you turned all of these things inside out, you would probably come up with a list of Christian virtues, which reinforces the idea that if, if this is the darkness, then a group of people who live and look differently are going to be light. Ron, how about you? Uh, unappeasable. Um, I can think of uh, people that uh, w would not be willing to uh, talk to you, to uh, forgive you, or to uh, sit down and uh, discuss the problem rationally, but uh, they just pick up stakes and say, I'm leaving. Right. I can't take this anymore. You can't do anything to fix this. We're out of here. Right. Okay. They can't be appeased. Mm -hmm. Yes. Slanderous. Um, spreading lies about somebody, either to harm them because you don't like them, or to build yourself up by making yourself look better. Okay. Uh, where are we? Without self-control. Well, immediately, obviously, a lot of the, the cardinal sins that everyone flags. Um, the seven deadly ones? Yeah. Like yeah. But basically, the obviously, uh, that's what I'm looking for. The predisposition towards uh, sexual or drug issues or gambling issues, anything that illustrates that you are being possessed by desire rather than uh, having master and ownership over yourself. And obviously nothing like that ever happens in the church. No, no, so, but or in Johnson County. Yeah. So there's other, other ways things can manifest too. If you're quick to anger um, with you know, a parent or vice versa, or even 
yeah, insistent on something and not being able to show restraint to actually hear other people and work through issues. Right. Very good. We could continue, and maybe the sampling that we've done with your illustrations gets us far enough along uh, on the right track. And how many of you can actually think of people who really stand out in your mind? Doesn't have to be current, maybe someone in your past who really exemplifies one of these things or more. Yeah, you can attach some faces to it. I hope with some humility, but it's almost like the brain makes the connection. So, and they weren't, I'm guessing, they weren't people who were now serving life in prison because they were so wickedly evil that they're in maximum security. They're probably just out in the world living like everybody else does. I could think of people like that. So they're treacherous. They don't love the good. They're reckless. They're swollen with conceit. There's that self-love again. They love pleasure. You can see the word hedonism in there. Phil, uh, Philadonis. That's where we get hedonism from. They don't love God. However, there can be from that group people who have the appearance of godliness, but they don't have its power. Hmm. That's a nice transition point from the, the pool of humanity to for among them, or literally, out of this, out of these, are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. We're back to the teachers now, the false teachers. And the weak women are those who are easily led astray because of their passions. They're always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. So they're the, they're the use that the wolves go after. And maybe they are hobbled in some way. Uh, weak women isn't exactly what the, the, the terminology means. It actually means it's a diminutive. It means they're, they're small women. But it's not about their size. It's a way to describe them in their vulnerability or maybe in their lack of um, emotional health. And so they're targets. They might be targets for sexual conquest. They might be targets for their bank accounts. They might be targets for any number of things. But the kinds of people who target even believing women like this come from this larger pool. And this is true in Johnson County as well as all the other nasty places on the face of the earth. And is it necessary to just be Oops. female? In this case it is. Really? Yes. Yep. We're, we're trying to stick with the text. And I like the image that I used of the vulnerable member in a community. The fault doesn't necessarily uh, reside exclusively with that vulnerable member. In fact, that person should be cared for and protected by a loving community. But they're the people who are targeted by the false teachers. Not exclusively. In fact, there's no one passage where we get exclusive information or exhaustive information. Right? I'm using representative passages. But that's what he's saying here. They, remember the, the, the Pharisees who devour whose homes? Whose houses do the Pharisees devour? Widows. Widows. Right? Target people who are vulnerable. Um, how many elderly people are taken by scams? Because they're especially vulnerable with electronic media or a certain level of trust for people in authority, right? And there's the heartlessness. There's the self-love and the love of money. People who would self-consciously go after marks because they are unprotected. Timothy says that's where your church work is happening. And 
Could this also be an allusion to the Genesis narrative in that the man was supposed to work and keep the garden and then failing to do so? Mm, it would be a very distant one, and it's because of the, the, the diminutive of the word woman. That's this particular type of word, so... So we can stop there. I, nothing that I do on any Wednesday night necessarily has to be exhaustive. The Janice and Jambres illustration not only comes from the Bible, uh, but it sort of testifies that this is a pattern in redemptive history. The, the, the age to come that's arrived hasn't brought the end of tribulation. In fact, it sort of inaugurated it. So any thoughts or questions? Why would uh, Paul say in the last days here when people have been this way from the beginning of time? Right. It's it, no worse. Right. It just isn't any better. Well. Christ's resurrection didn't make it better. It Christ's didn't. resurrection didn't make it better, but it probably aggravated the existing conflict, which a study of the book of Revelation would suggest because there are n there is no spirit-filled community in the world before the day of Pentecost, right? But I also pointed out last week that it's it, Timothy knows all this, right? By the way, when Paul says, but understand this, he's saying, know this. And it's like a way of saying, let me remind you forcefully that if you had an expectation for the last days that included a fulfillment of Israel's hope, right, all the good stuff that goes on in the last days, then you need to reorient yourself because all that good stuff is with the Lord and in the heavenly realm. Down here, it's scorched earth all the way until the parousia, when all that good stuff which already exists, will be uncovered. This is not the last days that people would have hoped for. From a Jewish mindset. Right. That's what makes passages like Mark 13 a little bit unnerving and shocking, because Jesus talks about eschatology in the context of lots of bad things happening. And we made the mistake evangelically to push all of that off to the final seven years before Jesus comes back, which sort of leaves us a little bit uninformed and unguided and maybe too optimistic. So if, I guess kind of along that line, if the last days, as far as Paul's concerned, have already begun, why then does he use the future tense in ah, this passage? Right, because I think he foresees a time that is going to be characterized by just this sort of thing. It's a, it's a manner of speaking, because his imperatives are actually in the present tense. Okay, so he's forecasting, as it were, the features of last day's tribulation. Well, we can officially end, and then if anyone wants to stick around and chat or have some questions, because I don't want to keep people after the, the time. So I think next time we'll look at the other side of it, which is if these are the circumstances under which the church is being planted and growing and organizing and worshiping, what sort of people do we need to guard it? Timothy, I need to tell you. Titus, I need to tell you. These are the kinds of men you need to find to be the shepherds, to keep the wolves out. So it's almost better to, to listen to the elder qualification lists against this backdrop of tribulation, where Paul's stress is on character quality.
not just knowledge of doctrine. No, did I miss the Old Testament story about Janus and Jambres? No. Those names were attached to the two mu magicians, musicians I was about to say, <laughs> who when Moses threw down his staff and it turned, they threw down their staffs and it turned into serpents after Moses' staff. Jewish tradition named them Janus and Jambres. Aren't they Egyptians? Yeah. Okay. So they weren't part of the people of God? No. Okay. Thank you for asking. Well, I was waiting for you to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I, I met my quote as <laughs> So that's just tradition. I mean, they weren't actually named in, back in Exodus. No. Yeah, huh. yeah there's, there's a tendency among religious writers to name the unnamed in the Bible. Mike. Um, I just got a little question here. I know it's a bit to off topic, but it's uh, in, a, in Timothy. And it's, um, I think it's chapter 5, verse 23, First Timothy. And uh, it's, uh, stop drinking only water, um, but have a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. I was wondering if you had any um, insight on that, because I know that wine... Um, at least, I think it's in maybe Ephesians, um, kind of references just all alcohol, um, where it, like is talking about um, do not get drunk off wine. Right, but be wine. filled with the Spirit. Yeah, um, and I was just wondering, like, um, is that like, is stop drinking only water, but have a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent illness? Is that like, um, would that be a violation of the holy temple of God, which is your body? No, I don't think so. I think, you know, the Lord's Supper includes wine, right? Or communion or the Eucharist, whatever language you want to use to describe it. What, uh, what's so interesting about that passage is it's personal advice to Timothy. Timothy is Paul's son, not literally, of course, but in the faith. And they have a, a very personal and affectionate relationship, right? And so basically Paul recalls Timothy as someone who struggles with certain ailments, maybe related to his digestive system. How unspiritual is that? And it made it into the New Testament. And so he reminds Timothy personally that this is a good practice. He's being uh, Dr. Brooks, just for a minute, that maybe your stomach issues can be alleviated if you just took wine instead of exclusively water, especially when water might not be safe and clean in every single situation where he would get a drink. Mm -hmm. The Ephesians passage is helpful because it, I think, it assumes a distinction between wine used in a responsible way and wine used in an irresponsible way, mm -hmm. I got you. which I think would be typical of the Bible's view. Mm -hmm. Good night. <laughs>